Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Environmental Protection Commission to order. Um, would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? Um, Commissioner Miller, can you lead us in the pledge today? Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if you would please say an invitation for us. Thanks for the warning. <laughs> Our gracious and heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you allow us to come together today to make decisions to make this county a better place for everyone to live, work, and play. We ask that you uh, humble our hearts and relate our minds we make these decisions, Father. And if we disagree, Father, let's make sure that when we leave here, we're on one accord because we're all here to work to make this county the best it possibly can be. We ask you to be with our first responders that put their lives on the line for us each and every day. When their work is done, bring them, take them back to their homes and find everything safe and sound. When our work is done, we ask you to take us back to our homes and find everything safe and sound. These are all blessings. We ask you in righteous and holy name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Before we move forward, I'd like to read a memorandum into the record from Commissioner Overman. Uh, it, it, she says, unfortunately, I'm unable to attend today's meeting as I will be in Tallahassee for Florida Association of Counties Legislative Day. Please read the reason for my absence into the record. All right, and uh, moving on then to the agenda. Um, come, uh, Janet Doherty, do we have any changes to the agenda? No, Commissioner, we do not. All right. Um, then we have uh, recognitions and proclamations. Um, the first one is uh, by Director Doherty for uh, a farewell to Ron Spiller. Uh, yes, Commissioner. And before we start that, I did want to give a, a shout out or recognition to two interns that are here. One is for Commissioner Merman, and that is Sam Recheck. Would you stand? There he is. And the other one is Bryce Connolly with uh, Commissioner White. Will you stand, please? We interns are very valuable, so we like to have them. If I can also uh, introduce Maddie McConaughey, our Stetson intern for the legal department. Thank you. All right. Well, very good. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to wing it. <laughs> Best laid plans of mice and men. Good morning, commissioners. Um, it's a, a wonderful time here to recognize Ron Spiller. Uh, I'm not sure that this board knows, but we work hand in hand with code enforcement. They are in our building. Uh, Ron has helped us with yard waste facilities, illegal landfilling noise complaints, I mean, typically we're called out together when people complain. Um, I'd like to, you know, he has had 37 years of a distinguished career with the county and the sheriff's department. And I'd just like to go over some quick highlights. Um, he attained rank of major while working for the sheriff's department. Tomorrow he will have his final farewell with um, the code over at the sheriff's department. In 2015, uh, the county made him the director of code enforcement and pet resources, I think, as they were going out to the new director for pet resources. In 2016, he became the, the, just the director of code enforcement. And he is leaving Florida, although he has a condo in Clearwater, so he'll be back from time to time, for Lakeway, Tennessee, where he has built the most beautiful house on a lake up there. And he is going to be an entrepreneur. He is going to go into uh, the snowy franchise business. He's going to make snow cones, and uh, it's really a very cool thing. He's going to come back here, and we can go visit him at the Strawberry Festival year to year and go get a snow cone from him. But um, with that, I'd like to have Ron come up, present him with a certificate and a few gifts from EPC and the directors. Ron, would you come up? Thank you. 
Ron, I, I feel like it, we are just a family. He comes up to me. We, we badge into each other's offices and go back and forth. But it's been such a pleasure working with you and staff. I remember Hurricane uh, Irma and how we had to all deploy to EOC and stay there for two days and go over here to the, the, the Public Works Building. But uh, it's truly been a pleasure. And EPC staff loves you very much. We wanted to give you a few items. We wanted to give you the lucky turtle. So you can take a lucky turtle with you. We have a box so you can carry it safely to Tennessee. We have gotten um, you a Fred certificate. I know what you like, a Cracker Barrel certificate as well. Some uh, Fred's Kitsch so you can represent Plant City Proud. Some chocolate and, to, and we have a book at the agency that everyone is signing from Code. And this is a thing that we gave away at EPC the giving tree. And so with that, the final thing, before I read your certificate, this is one of my favorite nature photographers. His name is R.J. Wiley, and he's in Naples, and I probably have 20 of his prints. But I thought this, this beautiful scene on the Gulf would remind you and your wife that you need to keep coming back and visiting Florida, especially when it's snowing. <laughs> so with that, let me read your um, certificate of appreciation. Today, presented to Ron Spiller with sincerest appreciation for a lifetime of excellence and service to the citizens of Hillsborough County. As director of Hillsborough County Code Enforcement, you demonstrated exemplary dedication and commitment to the environment through your support of our agency. Thank you for always ensuring that code-related issues resulting in environmental impacts were resolved efficiently and effectively to the benefit of the natural resources. We wish you all the best in your retirement. Awarded this day, January 2020. Thank you. Thank you. And the final thing, we'll give him his baton. We have two batons. This baton will be your last day here, and we have one for Joe Gross when his first day is February 3rd. So we'll present him with his when he comes over to the, to the agency. But with that, we thank you so much, and would you like to say a few words? Well, thank you, Janet, for taking the time to put all this together, and thank you, commissioners, for taking the time to uh, have Janet do this. This was unexpected. I, she mentioned this to me the other day. I'll tell you that uh, we've had a great working relationship with EPC, and I'll, t I'll tell you as the bo EPC board that we have a great organization. It's a, it's a happy workplace. They have a good time. I know they do a lot of work, and they're very, very dedicated to their work, so you should all be proud of the EPC organization. Um, and, and that's all. And after 37 years of uh, the sheriff's office, uh, 31 at the sheriff's office and six here at code enforcement, um, kind of entrepreneur person in, uh, in a government body during my life. And uh, so I found a business where in talking to people who actually do it, everybody says everyone you deal with is happy, which is a total contrast to the 37 <laughs> years I've had. So I look forward to that. And I, I thank you for your time. Thank you, and um, we have a couple of commissioners who want to say something. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. I just really want to thank you for your exemplary service, and um, you know, I know the. It's just been amazing some of the reports we've heard back about what uh, code enforcement and together with the EPC has done. So thank you so much. And I just wondered, are we getting him a moving van to get all that stuff out? <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Miller, um, I've had a lot of town hall meetings uh, that we requested your presence and your staff presence to. And many of those town hall meetings, 99% of the questions were about code enforcement. And you were always there, uh, sometimes more staff than people, but you were always there and your staff was always on top of what we had to, to deal with in our district. And I want to tell you we appreciate that. But I also want to let you know that um, mm -hmm that this board has, has contacted the state of Florida. We're not going to let you retire. You have to stay here now. You can't, you can't do that. But uh, we wish you the very best on whatever your future endeavors are and ice cones or whatever it is. That shaved you ice. Shaved ice. ice. Shaved ice. But, well, I know uh, that you're uh, retiring soon, so if you want a leisurely job, <laughs> give me a call. I'll give you a call. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make me off. I can't refuse, right? Right. <laughs> but the best of luck to you. Thank you. Commissioner Merman, you're recognized. Thank you. I love the picture of Commissioner Miller handing out snow cones. <laughs> it's a good one. But Ron, uh, this is from Della. 
and Jeffrey and now Craig and I thank you for everything. You spent more time in my office, I think, than you did in your office. Um, we had so many constituent issues over the years, and um, you were always so professional and so, um, you know, you're decisive. I really liked how you handled everything and uh, made us feel good that you guys would go and take care of the situations when we told you about them. So, and I know it's still going to continue, uh, but I, I tell you, your leadership and you training all those guys to do what you've been doing, I think will be, uh, will last a long time. So I do appreciate, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you. Well, I was running a little late this morning, but got here just in time. Uh, Ron, I, I think the world of you, you've always been a tremendous help to our office and we just had a chance to get together recently and, and chat and, and have a send off, if you will. And I, I just wish you all the best up there in, in East Tennessee and um, hang in there up there in Vol country as a, as a fellow Florida Gator. Uh, I know you're going to enjoy the, the seasons and the beautiful scenery up there, but um, uh, you know, as you've said, you know, particularly in my district, you know, there's that fine balance between, you know, those that have, you know, lived out in, you know, what used to be the country and, you know, maybe they have an old car or something out in the yard and, you know, it's, you know, really don't view themselves as harming anyone versus those cases that are really the egregious cases that are really uh, a problem for our community. And that's really a... A balancing act and you've always been level-headed and, and really been able to to navigate those situations uh, carefully and very professionally and I uh, hope that your uh, that your successor uh, you know comes uh, comes forward with the same level-headedness and common sense approach to dealing with these issues but wish you all the best good luck with the shaved ice business enjoy your time up there in, in East Tennessee and when you come back home uh, be sure to, to come by and say hello to us Will do, thank you. And while we gather for a photograph, I would like to explain to the commissioners that uh, we have a little bit of a technical snafu, so you'll have to push your buttons to speak, but then clear yourselves after you've spoken today because these buttons aren't working. You broke the machine. <laughs> First day. <laughs> All right, after all the hugging, Ms. Doherty, <laughs> will you take us through the next, uh, next item? Yes, Commissioner. Um, we are going to be receiving the 2019 Urban Excellence Award, and I would like to call up the co-chairs. of It was for the EPC's Clean Air Fair. These two individuals work tirelessly. It's such a successful event. So I want to bring up Jeff Sims and Michelle Jenkins to go through the presentation and also introduce the individual from the... Uh, Downtown Partnership. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, good morning, commissioners. We are very excited to be here this morning. We love talking about the Clean Air Fair. Um, it's an event that we, has evolved into what we consider the agency's signature event over the years. So this year will be our 19th consecutive year of hosting this annual lunchtime event. Um, it will once again be in the heart of downtown Tampa at Poe Plaza, just down the street. Uh, it started off in recognition of Clean Air Month, and it's always held on the first Thursday of May. 
Um, the, the first few years, I would call them very, uh, very humble beginnings. We were just across the street, just a handful of exhibitors and, and, a, and a small crowd. But we forged ahead and um, continued to grow the event and its reputation. And we're, we're pleased now that we consistently have well over 1,000 people that, that come visit the event and over 60 exhibitors and a very high return rate on the, um, on the number of exhibitors each year. So we grew the event primarily by recognizing what the crowd reacted to best. And we realized that this promoted a more direct personal interaction with the public and allowed us to provide environmental information and also respond to their concerns and questions regarding the local environment. So live music has been a staple of the event since the beginning, along with uh, live animals and complimentary giveaways, including ice cream. And more recently, we've been able to acquire tree saplings, which we've been able to hand out for free to the public in, in recognition of Arbor Day. Uh, also through the event, we've reached out to the youth of the community, primarily through our annual photography contest, which was done in conjunction with Clean Air Month. And we've done this again for 19 years. We started this at the same time as the fair. And uh, we're very proud to display the winning photos at the event. And uh, it's rewarding because several of the students are usually able to come out and see their works on display to the public. And it's very rewarding to watch their reactions. Uh, one other item I would mention is, is our theme development. Each year we, we brainstorm and we come up with a new theme with an environmental tie-in uh, to try to be a focal point. And we've done everything from selfies to Game of Thrones to emojis and last year with superheroes. So it's kind of a creative spin that we do, but we, to, we feel like it keeps it a little bit more fresh and topical and, and a little bit more fun for the, the visitors and the exhibitors and also for EPC staff. And while it is a labor of love for us to host the Clean Air Fair, we are so grateful to all participating staff across all of the divisions of the agency for their dedication, their creativity, and collaboration to establish a solid foundation and to breathe life into the fair every year. But the ultimate um, success of the event is truly due to the support and the leadership of this board, our executive director, and our amazing partners. And we have so many amazing partners that participate. It is through their generosity in giving of their time, of their resources, of making donations to the event, and of advertising to bring people down that we're able to create a lively clean air fair um, that has a thriving heartbeat for all the community to share. And Tampa Downtown Partnership has certainly been one of those incredible partners that has worked with us along the way. So at this time, I would like to invite up Karen Kress, who is the Director of Transportation and Planning with the Tampa Downtown Partnership, to share a few words about their great work and the Urban Excellence Award. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning, EPC Board. Uh, Karen Kress with the Tampa Downtown Partnership. We are a small but mighty nonprofit organization that works toward the revitalization of downtown. And it's been my pleasure to have worked with the EPC on this event since I started. I think I've been there about as long as the, um, the, the event has gone on. I'm also the kind of resident tree hugger on staff, so it's a good fit for me anyway. Um, but our Urban Excellence Awards, it's, they're 12 years old. Let me just uh, read you a quick description of them. So um, the, the point of the awards is to celebrate individuals, businesses, organizations, events, and projects that have created a positive and lasting impact in Tampa's downtown. The 2019 Urban Excellence Awards was held on November 6th at the Tampa Museum of Art. We had a record-breaking 240 nominees, winners, members, and supporters in attendance, creating a fun and memorable night to remember. This year's nominees and winners truly reflected the leadership, innovation, talent, and community spirit of Tampa's downtown. So I checked with our staff person who runs this program. We have an independent jury who makes all the decisions on who wins. To my knowledge, this is the first time that an event in downtown has ever won, and I asked her what kind of resonated with our jury, and she said the fact that this event has been going on for 18 years, yet they have a different theme and they keep it fresh every single year, and it is, I mean, several of you have been. It's, you can barely walk through it, it's so crowded. So if you haven't been, it's the place to be, and we were thrilled that EPC was able to win one of the Urban Excellence Awards. So. And our, our awards were fabricated locally by um, an iron smith, so we were very proud of them. So, so we'll go up here. And grab up here? Oh, okay. okay. Well, 
This is a nice twist. Uh, we're getting an award instead of giving an award. Very nice. Here we go. One, two, and three. Uh oh. Oh, I didn't catch it that time. All right, here we go. All right, one, two, and three. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, while Commissioner Kemp makes her way to the podium, um, I'll just say that today we are acknowledging and supporting World Wetlands Day, which is celebrated annually on February 2nd in recognition of the 1971 adoption of the Convention on Wetlands. In honor of this year's theme, we emphasize the importance of wetlands biodiversity and take this opportunity to promote actions which prevent the loss of our valuable wetland resources. The EPC Wetlands Division safeguards groundwater, surface water, and natural flood mitigation areas, preserving wildlife habitat and coastal shorelines that are unique to Hillsborough County. And so at this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Kemp. I'm, I'm pleased to be um, uh, having the former chair of the EPC give this uh, wetlands uh, Wetlands Day proclamation, it's uh, so important to us and the function of EPC. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I guess we wanted to, do you have the EPC staff uh, as well? Kit Tapley and Andy Schiffer. Okay. Want to have, we know. <laughs> the wetlanders. <laughs> there we go. Um, whereas wetlands are critical, as we all know, for protecting the quality of Hillsborough County's aquifers, creeks, lakes, rivers, and springs. In addition to sustaining the region's ecosystem and maintaining flood control. And whereas wetlands are essential for a healthy and productive Tampa Bay, stabilizing shorelines, providing nurseries for fish and rookeries for birds, and serving as an important habitat for numerous wetland species. And whereas the Environmental Protection Commission of Hillsborough County, the EPC promotes public awareness of the county's valuable wetlands, often referred to as nature's kidneys. And whereas the commission supports environmental efforts to safeguard and conserve local wetlands, illustrating the organization's mission to protect the county's natural resources and quality of life. And whereas since the inception of the EPC's wetlands program, wetland impacts have been mitigated through creation, enhancement, and preservation, thereby achieving zero net loss. And whereas the EPC appreciates the residents and numerous organizations and agencies for their stewardship in the conservation of the county's wetland habitats. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Hillsborough County, Florida, does hereby declare February 2nd, 2020, as World Wetlands Day in Hillsborough County and encourages all government and government agencies, residents and visitors to help support the EPC and its mission to safeguard the county's wetland habitats and its overall ecosystem. Thank you, so thank, you thank you. Would you like to say a few wetland words? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we talk about them a lot. Well, commissioners, thank you very much. Um, it's a delight to be the director of the wetlands division and it's uh, wonderful to have this wetlands proclamation today to recognize wetlands. Uh, since the 1700s, uh, we've lost about 87% and even maybe more alarming since uh, 1970, we've lost about 35% in the world. So World Wetlands Day is a, an opportunity to recognize that and uh, it's wonderful that this board is recognizing that as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're now moving to public comment. 
Uh, is there any member of the public who wish to speak? We allowed three minutes of public comment for anyone. Seeing none, uh, we'll move to um, approve the consent agenda. Um, we're just going to have to take a voice vote. Okay. All right. Commissioner Merman and uh, seconded by Commissioner Kemp. Please record your votes. Motion carried five to zero. All right, moving to the regular agenda then. Um, first item, uh, Ms. Doherty. Um, Commissioner, the first presentation, 8A, is by, uh, it's on USF on a study regarding microbial source tracking. Uh, it's uh, funded in part by our EPC's Pollution Recovery Fund, but it was, compl it was done by USF. And I'm going to bring Chris Pratt up to the podium to um, introduce the individual who will be giving the presentation and talk a little bit about the microbial study. Good morning, Commissioners. I am Chris Pratt, EPC staff, and I am the project manager for EPC's Pollution Recovery Fund grant program. I'm here this morning to introduce Dr. Jody Howard from the University of South Florida, who is going to give you a presentation on a project that was funded by a Pollution Recovery Fund grant. First, I'd like to say a few words about the grant program itself. Thanks. The Pollution Recovery Fund program provides grant money for projects to restore polluted areas, mitigate the effects of pollution, and enhance pollution control activities within Hillsborough County. PRF is funded by administrative penalties obtained through enforcement for the correction of pollution, and since 1987 has provided over $8 million in funding for environmental projects in Hillsborough County. In 2015, the EPC Commission awarded PRF funds to Dr. Harwood for the project titled Determining Sources and Risk of Fecal Pollution in Tampa Bay Tributaries. Dr. Harwood is a professor and chair in US, USF's Department of Integrated Biology, where her research focuses on water quality microbiology and microbial ecology. She'll present you with an overview of the project and provide recommendations for further study. And Dr. Harwood. Good morning, commissioners. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. And hello, audience. It's weird for me to turn my back on an audience, but I guess I can figure that out. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit today about the research that we've done in collaboration with the EPC and start out with discussing just briefly the problem that we're addressing. And so you see in the uh, slide before you several types of animals and then a cityscape. And this represents the various types of, of fecal pollution that could be inputted to a water body. And then in the center of the slide, you see this temporary health warning. So inputs of fecal contamination, so basically poop, is deleterious to water quality and it is also a human health risk and an environmental health risk. So I mentioned human health risks and environmental health risks. And we know that nutrients cause eutrophication, which leads to fish kills and algal blooms. Fecal contamination, um, fe feces contain disease-causing microorganisms or pathogens, and these can impact the health of recreational water users, people who are swimming, fishing, and even boating in the water and using the beaches. And Reduction and prevention of further contamination requires that we know something about the source of the contamination. Since, as I showed previously, we have various different types of contaminant inputs that could be impacting water quality. So just really briefly, to give you a little bit of microbiology on this subject, how do we know if water is contaminated by feces? Um, you all may have heard of um, E. coli, and you may have heard of it in the context of being a, a pathogen, so you may have heard it, of it be contaminating lettuce and making people sick, but all, all of our GI tracts and dog GI tracts and horse GI tracts, the GI tracts, gastrointestinal tracts of almost all animals contain a lot of E. coli. Most of them are actually good for us. There's only a few pathogenic species, but we use these intestinal bacteria that are common to many animals and humans to indicate the potential for 
fecal contamination, and therefore the pathogens, the disease-causing organisms that enter the water along with these organisms like E. coli and enterococci that we call fecal indicator bacteria. And we measure these on these cute little plates, and we, we count the colonies, the dots on the plates, and, um, and then we can transfer that into some sort of an indication of how polluted the water might be with fecal contamination. But these fecal indicator bacteria like E. coli and enterococci have some major shortcomings, and this is really a lot of what my research for the last 25 years has been about. I hate to admit 25 years, but yes, it's true. Uh, so these, as I mentioned, these fecal indicator bacteria are found in human and animal feces. So they don't tell us what the contamination source is. So you may see that a beach is posted, and so we know that there's been fecal contamination detected, fecal indicator bacteria, but we don't know if that came from sewage or if it came from a bunch of dogs, perhaps, or even just birds. There may have been a local, a local rookery or you know, birds that just happened to be there. So with these many different sources of fecal contamination, we don't have any indication of where they're coming from. Um, these fecal indicator bacteria, like E. coli and enterococci, can also grow in certain circumstances in soils and in the underlying sediments of water bodies. And so they can give a, what we call a false positive indication of recent fecal contamination. And that can exaggerate the health risk that we might, that we would be inferring from the presence of these bacteria. Because remember, they're indicators. They're not pathogens. They're not disease causing in and of themselves. So we have, uh, again, I mentioned been doing this for about 25 years. And so we've been working on um, methodology that are basically a high tech supplement to the use of fecal indicator bacteria. So again, these fecal indicator bacteria can serve as a broad warning about mm, we have a problem here. But if we can supplement this, Using the fecal or using microbial source tracking, the, the um, methods that I work on, then we can get better indications about source. So envision this. I'm going to just flip down through all of these. So I, I think I can explain this better with the picture. Certain microorganisms we know are found only in the gastrointestinal tracts of certain animals. Others, like E. coli and Enterococci, are, are pervasive throughout many, many different kinds of animals. So what we do is we look for what we call host-associated microorganisms. These are ones that, again, they're constrained usually to a particular type of animal. So if you see in this little slide in the top where there's, um, where there's a cow, you see, and I love this little cartoon, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of little black kind of oblong shaped things, and those are meant to be E. coli. And you see that, that they're in the cow poop, and they're in the human poop, and then they're in the chicken poop. So we have the cow, human, and chicken. Um, and so, so, the, so the, again, the black rods, E. coli, aren't going to tell us anything about source. But you see that the cattle only has the yellow circles, the human has the, has the red circles, and the chicken has the blue circles. Those are the host-specific or host-associated bacteria that we can use as so-called, we call them markers for microbial source tracking. So we can look for those specific organisms and say, okay, now we have an indication of where the source is coming from or what the source of the fecal pollution is. So here's the really high tech part, is that we use polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, to, as a forensic tool to detect the organisms, these host associated organisms that I was just talking about. And so in this example, here's cow, cow poop, and you see I've got the little, the little blue oblongs in the, in the cow pad, and those are gonna be the, the cow specific bacteria. And so we assess, we measure the number of cow-specific bacteria in a particular water body by checking for the DNA of these bacteria. So this is where the polymerase chain reaction, the PCR, comes in. You've probably heard of this in you know, forensic examinations. Well, so P just as PCR of um, a, a, a semen sample can indicate who it belongs to, so PCR in this case can <coughs> indicate if there are these specific bacteria and so PCR, I like to describe it as a, a Xeroxing machine for DNA because it's very specific. And with every cycle of the PCR, you get more and more and more. So if you start with a very small amount of DNA, you can end up with a lot of it and then you can detect it and, and do scientific fun things with it. So 
with that background then, I'm just going to really briefly talk about um, the, uh, the fund study that we did in collaboration with the, um, with the EPC. And I want to thank um, Chris Pratt and Tom Ash for a, a lot of great collaboration. It's much more fun to do these projects when you have um, partners that are interacting and helping with decision making. So the, basically the qu main question was, can we determine the sources of fecal indicator bacteria in uh, creeks and watersheds in this Hillsborough County area with contrasting land use. And so the tools we used were the microbial source tracking markers, and we pr specifically used one that we call GFD, and that's for birds, and one that we call um, HF183, which is for humans. So that, that H, you can think of as human. Um, GFD, I don't have a good way to connect that for you, but anyway, that's the, that's the bird one. And we also did nutrient analyses. So we did um, nitrogen analyses, phosphorus, uh, carbon, to see if we could connect the nutrients in the water to the micro microbial contamination. And we, in collaboration with EPC, we, we looked at a, a urban watershed, which was Sweetwater Creek, and we looked at a rural suburban watershed which was Bullfrog Creek. And so the two pins on the map show you the red pin up toward the top would be the Sweetwater Creek area, and the red pin more in the middle would be the Bullfrog Creek area. And for those of you who are familiar with that, you know, Bullfrog Creek runs all the way down to uh, Tampa Bay, as does, as does Sweetwater Creek. So these are, both, these are both long creeks that have, um, in the case of Sweetwater, very much kind of urban, residential, going more towards a bit more um, industrial, towards the Tampa Bay end, and then Bullfrog Creek up up to oops, sorry I can't I can't um, up toward the um, uh, to, to the uh, eastern side, the eastern part is very rural, and then it it goes much more suburban as it um, progresses. I'll be able to show that a little bit better on this map. Um, so we worked in. Um, we worked in Big Bullfrog Creek, which is the red trace, and up toward the um, eastern end of Bullfrog Creek, is, is, it's very rural, mostly cow fields, and the, the yellow trace would be Little Bullfrog Creek. Um, that has a lot of new development. If you look up toward the eastern end and the headwaters, the headwaters is kind of a little swampy area. We actually went to the headwaters. Um, and so that's, that is, has a lot of new recent development up there, and then it kind of goes through and then it joins in with Big Bullfrog um, into the main stem of Bullfrog Creek. And the BF-167 that you see there, that site is the EPC historical measuring site where they have lots and lots of data. And then BF-1 and BF-2 are two sites that we sampled at. So this is, again, the more, the more um, uh, rural that we, we might be expect to see some agricultural impacts. Now, Sweetwater, um, if you look up toward the, the top of the slide, so that would be Lake Magdalene, that's the headwaters, and then, again, it goes, Sweetwater goes down through um, a very um, suburban residential area, and then as it gets down more towards the SW2 and especially SW3, there's a lot more um, industrial activity down there. So those were our sites in Sweetwater Creek. And so, um, and this feels weird because usually I would talk for another 40 minutes about this, but I know we don't have enough time. So um, the con our conclusions were that um, BF1, so that was, the, that was the stem of bullfrog. It was kind of the, the middle one, the yellow one, where I said there was a lot of new development. Um, that, was our, that was the most polluted site with fecal indicator bacteria, and that was followed by, by BF167. That was the EPC site that was the, the most downstream of the, of the three. And these... Mm -hmm two sites were the only ones that showed um, higher, sp higher spikes of HF183, which is the human marker. So we know that there is some sort of sewage contamination that's going on in these, in these water bodies. And so um, we, we, we couldn't pinpoint it, but that might be for, for a, different, uh, a different time. We, we couldn't pinpoint the exact place where it was happening. Um, we know that bird feces contributed to the fecal indicator bacteria levels in bullfrog and sweetwater, but to a, um, not to a dominant extent. So again, there's more exploration to be done in these water bodies. We did a, a cool multivariate analysis, and one thing that we showed that was that the human HF183 um, was correlated with nitrite. And nitrite you can find in sewage and in other types of fecal contamination and in fertilizer. So this is kind of an anthropogenic connection that we'd love to explore further at some anthropogenic meaning from human, horse, human sources. So we'd love to explore this further um, in, um, in, in, in another round of research. 
Uh, so, yes, further explore relationships in terms of our path forward between um, nitrate and sediment organic matter, which we also found some associations, um, and Bullfrog Creek and, and possibly another watershed. Um, we want to incorporate some streams that have a little bit different geomorphology. So um, these streams were fairly, well, they actually weren't that similar, but we'd like to look at how the underlying sediments of the streams may be influencing the bacterial levels. We'd like to do more of what we call adaptive sampling, which is basically find an area that's hot and then keep following it. Hot meaning a lot of these bacteria that we're really interested in and go back and keep following that, drill down on that area. And um, we want to look at another human associated uh, bacteria, an e, an e. coli assay that we've been um, uh, working on recently that has a lot of promise that could reinforce the HF183 results. And also um, we have a, a cattle marker that we could use in Bullfrog Creek and I think that would be interesting, especially in the more, uh, on the more rural side of it. And with that, I would really like to thank um, the, the EPC staff. All of them were amazing, great, fun to work with. We walked the whole water body of Little Bullfrog Creek one day, and that was a, a fabulous collaboration. Um, and my graduate students who worked on this were, were wonderful. Jacob Sinkbeil and Dawei Tang have both graduated. And then the whole EPC teams I mentioned. So thanks a lot, and hopefully we have time for a few questions if you all have any. Any questions? Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. And thank you for the presentation. I almost presentation. feel like a junior scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's um, great. I'm just curious about uh, so um, Little Bull Frog Creek mm -hmm. the, uh, with the um, contamination. So the only two, I, I'm just wondering about this connection. Sure. The only, I think the only two land application. Um, places that we have that we are still had been grandfathered in um, exist upstream of that. Is there any knowledge of you know that connection? Or I'm, I'm I have no idea. I mean, I don't see it on a map or anything. But yeah, that's actually something that we that that we wanted to um, explore, and we had talked about that. But I don't think that they are in that particular um, watershed because. Again, the headwaters of Little Bullfrog are a, a, a very nice swamp, and we didn't, get a, we didn't get a gradient along Little Bullfrog, which is what you would expect if you, were, if you had um, something up at the headwaters that was coming down. We had more, more episodic, you know, ping, ping, ping. So that could have been, um, in my experience, it may have been, um, older septic systems perhaps that were grandfathered oh. in um, and that's where you know really drilling down on that area might be might be helpful um, it could you know even new um, even new uh, sewer infrastructure can be problematic or or fail you can have overflows of um, of the lift stations um, you can have you know, cracks, leaks that you don't suspect. So again, if we can go back and, you know, drill down on that area a bit more, we can potentially find a particular spot where we have something going on. And I don't know that you can answer this. I just um, probably think, and others may know, but so the enforcement for septic, whatever it is, I have not gone into that area, but that rests with does that rest with the EPC? Uh, no. It's Good morning, Commissioner Sam Ravi, EPC staff. Uh, permitting and enforcement and compliance of septic tanks rests with the uh, Department of Health. Oh, that's right. By Florida statute, so they're in charge of permitting, compliance, and enforcement. The only time EPC gets involved in a septic tank issue, if the septic tank fails and the discharge leaves the property and enters Hillsborough County water, goes off-site. So in addition to the health department taking action, we come in and beef up their action as well. So it's like a double hammer on the violation, but we typically do not get involved in septic tank issues. Thank you. Thank you, and um, these studies are so important to have this scientific data uh, on what, to inform us 
as we consider the, uh, the importance of uh, retrofitting septic systems, uh, as well as uh, wetland setbacks in order to protect our, our bay and, and our, our wetlands and our um, drinking water. Uh, essentially. So um, I really appreciate bringing these kinds of, of studies here so we can consider this data in our decision making. There's a lot more to go, but it's a really important function of our pollution recovery fund to be able to spend those dollars on um, studies that give us this real hard data. So, and thank you very much for your work. Oh, thank you. And if any of you, um, you can get my email address from, from Chris or Tom. It's vharwood at usf.edu. But if, if you ever, if you know of anybody who would like to have a little presentation somewhere where I can talk about this, I'm more than happy to because it's nice to be able to tell people more about how we assess water quality and what some of the new methodologies that we have to have a better understanding of what is impacting our water quality. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving to the next item, um, Ms. Doher, do you want to uh, introduce Ms. Yes. Ms. Um, th thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to bring up Elaine Delu, who is mm -hmm. our uh, Director of Administration and Finance. Um, before she gets started, um, I just and she may mention this in the presentation. The last time pay ranges were studied for our agency was around 2005. Um, I've met with all of you in your briefings, and we are lagging behind, even lagging behind the county. This board was very supportive three years ago of um, increasing the county's pay ranges and, and moving to a 50% uh, style for salary ranges. So we're, we're moving forward with this because we're, um, we need to retain people. We have a lot of people in drop. And we need to, we're having problems hiring environmental scientists ones uh, and, and perhaps twos as well, engineers, GIS, some of those high scientific individuals. Um, so I'm going to let Elaine uh, talk about this, but I did want to uh, tell everyone that uh, really uh, Mike Merrill emailed yesterday and said he was supportive of this. We met with Mike Merrill, Tom Fessler, Cheryl Ahrens, John Brickey. Uh, Bonnie Wise is apprised of it, and I really appreciate administration support of this agency. So with that, Elaine? Yes. Good morning, Commissioners. Elaine DeLue, EPC staff. I'm here to present the results of a compensation study that was performed. And back in 2018, we reached out to civil service to ask for a pay study. As Janet mentioned, one hadn't been done since 2005. And our goal was to look at EPC salary ranges and compare them to similar government agencies. So this is the compensation study that was done and we received it in August of 2018. It was in the backup agenda. It's 77 pages long. And Kurt Wilkening, who was with Silver Service at the time and currently works with Hillsborough uh, human resources. He's in the audience today in case you have any questions, but he did a great job of completing this study for us and we really appreciate it. So these were comparative agencies that were looked at. Um, salary midpoints including minimum and maximum pay ranges were compared to these counties and they do include Hillsborough, Pasco, and Polk counties. So the findings showed that overall our ranges lagged behind other similar markets. It also showed that our current salary ranges were too broad, resulting in our minimum pays being too low. The salary ranges presented in the report included the 50%, which was a midpoint or mean, 63%, and 75% of the ranges of comparative agencies. These were the classifications proposed for adjustments. They include administrative specialists, electronic technicians, engineering specialists, environmental scientists, and hydrologists. So we're here today asking for approval of adoption of the 50th percentile pay range plan from the 2019 compensation study. We're asking that these pay ranges be implemented as of up April 1st, 2020, and EPC will be absorbing the cost until September 30th of 2020. 
So we're asking that 110,000 be included in the FY 2021 budget to adjust for the impact of positions of the new pay ranges. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Uh, Commissioner Merman, you're recognized. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for bringing this forward. Um, you know, it's funny, when I was in the legislature, uh, EPC was always a topic of conversation. Um, the County <laughs> Commission, it was always a topic of a conversation to see um, people had different uh, viewpoints on the worth of the agency mm -hmm. and, and should it even still exist. Uh, but I have to say for myself, um, having been on the County Commission sitting on this board as um, an EPC commissioner on this board, um, I, I really have done such a 100% about face. And I think that this is important for the sustainability of the agency. Um, and looking long term, that people know that we're investing in it so that it is going to be a vested you know, agency for us here at the county. Uh, you do help us quite a bit. And um, all the research and the leadership, Janet, that you've shown in the agency, I mean, it really shows now. And so I'm, I'm happy to support this and look forward to many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. And we're discussing a motion uh, made to uh, accept the recommendation by Commissioner Miller, was it? And second by Commissioner Merman and Kemp. Um, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. Um, I just am in total support, and in fact, I hope that we do another study shortly. I know that this has been an issue for a while, especially with new, younger staff, and as we all know, regretfully, we're um, recognizing people over and over again as they retire. So we really have to look to a new generation, and, we re and in order for us to be competitive, and I know that um, I heard uh, several people were uh, leaving younger people for other agencies where they could get um, better salaries and we should not be notably uh, behind what is a competitive rate. When I was discussing this with you and this motion would take a mere $110,000 just in this initial step, which I hope is an initial step because yes. I hope we will move to uh, or that there will be another study done shortly and we'll, we'll get some um, better information about how to make the agency stronger in this regard. But um, when I heard it was just 110,000, I thought I was mishearing and I know I asked you several questions. Could this possibly, <clears throat> could we possibly just have 110,000 to even remedy this problem in the interim here? So I'm very, very happy to support this and um, only hope that we can um, look at it again shortly. Is that planned, any kind of? Um, Commissioner, we took the most conservative approach by adopting the 50 percentile. The recommendation from the report was actually to be a leading agency that we should adopt the middle one, which was the P63. But um, as we move forward, we will look at this again because what makes EPC so great, and I think Commissioner Merman t touched on that, was having leading scientists, highly skilled scientists, scientists that stay and can download all of the information from the individuals who are leaving. But we will look at it in the future. But this is just a step moving in the right direction to increase our pay ranges. Thank you. Commissioner Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me. If you, if you have not been out to EPC and talked to some of the staff, some of them are gone now, um, you ask how long they've been there. It's 20, 25, mm -hmm. 30 years. Uh, and that, as been said earlier, a lot of those uh, staff members are in drop and they're leaving. And talking to Ms. Doherty yesterday, uh, we're losing some of the young, bright minds that have been with EPC mm -hmm. to other agencies because of the mere fact that they're paying them more money. Uh, and we can't afford to do that. This, this organization is the best in the state, probably the best in this country, because other counties are trying to emulate it. If they can't emulate it, they call us to do it, their work for mm -hmm. them. So we cannot afford to have bright young minds that are here leaving, going someplace else. We've got to replace those folks that are retiring. And uh, I, I think that this is a start. I think mm -hmm. we need to come back and, as I as said before, do it again uh, so we can get you on a, a level playing field with everyone else. So that's why I was very happy to uh, make the motion. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to point out that EPC is a regulatory agency. Um, and, and in addition to uh, figuring out, delineating the wetlands to protect the wetlands, they work uh, with developers to uh, say not only you can't put your driveway there because there's a wetland, but to figure out how to reconfigure the site plan to say, well, you can put it over here and avoid the wetland impacts and uh, work with everyone to, to make things work in a way that protects our wetlands. And, and that regulatory function and engineering consultation has to be based on sound science and, and carried out by well-qualified professionals. Um, in order to have the credibility um, and, and confidence of our community all around. Um, so it's important to bring the pay ranges in line. And um, I think this is a good first step, as everyone is indicating. You've got a lot of confidence here in your board um, to uh, move ahead uh, later to make sure that uh, we staff APC um, well. Uh, for developers concerned about timely professional mm. reviews uh, and processing their applications, as well as for all of us concerned about protecting our environment, we all need EPC staffed well and, and professionally, and that takes a fair level of compensation that is comparable with all the other jobs available in this market. I understand you're down five wetland scientists right now? Correct. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a critical. challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's critical that we, we get this rolling now. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to support it as well. I uh, mm -hmm. think that's all the discussion. Um, please record your vote. Motion carried five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Commissioner. I see that go unanimously. And um, item C. Oh, thank you. Before we move on to item C, though, I do want to thank Kurt Wilkening so much. for. He spent a year in this study. He looked over every single employee, had to rewrite their JCQs. It was an exhaustive study. And I appreciate him at civil service, and I do appreciate him at human resources, and we also thank Ivy as well. So from administration, Mike Merrill, to Bonnie Wise, Tom Fessler, thank them all very, very much for their help in assisting us. Well thank said, a, a good team effort. Yes, ma'am. And with that, I'm gonna bring up Kim Tapley for item 8C, which um, is the presentation of a study regarding coastal development strategies on long-term coastline changes. She was an author of this. She'll tell you it was, it was published, I think, in the Science Journal or what, uh, one of the publications like that. And um, it has to do with submerged lands and the creation of submerged lands as well. So, Kim, with that. Thank you, Janet. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Kim Tapley, and today I will be speaking to you about my coastal development research. <laughs> First, a little background on myself. I work in the Wetlands Division as a Senior Environmental Manager. I have a bachelor's degree from USF in Environmental Science and a master's in Geology. I've worked at EPC in the Wetlands Division for 14 years, and I was a private consultant before that. While I was working on my master's degree, I helped co-author a coastal development research paper. The team included researchers from USF, Ninbo University in China, and Clark University in Massachusetts. Our paper was recently published in the scientific journal Papers in Applied Geography, and it compares the long-term coastline changes of Tampa Bay and Shaoxiang Harbor in China. Why do we research coastal zones and their development? One of the main reasons is that large populations live in these coastal areas. In 2010, about 44% of the world's population lived within 90 miles of the sea. 76% of the population in Florida lives inside these coastline counties. Another reason is its economic contribution. The ecosystem goods and services produced by marine habitats are estimated to be worth $24 trillion. That's 31% of the global total. 
And this map, you can see most of the megacities are located in these coastal zones. The population growth, urbanization, and industrialization have produced an intense pressure on these coastal ecosystems. Comparison of coastline change patterns and relevant human interferences between the developed countries and the developing countries provides insights on sustainable strategy for these coastal areas. Our study areas were Tampa Bay and Shaoxing Harbor in China. They both possess human, humid subtropical climate and dense population. They both have undergone distinct anthropogenic or human activities resulting in environmental impacts. After the literature review, the research team found that few studies compared these man-made impacts on coastline changes between the US and China. Ultimately, the team evaluated the efficient policies for coastal management, especially for the developing countries who faced the same coastal development issues. Here's a brief flowchart of the methodology of the study. I'll explain the methodology from the data collection to analyzing the man-made impacts on the coastline. The team collected aerial images to identify if the coastline changes were caused by man-made impacts. 30 years of aerial images were obtained for both Tampa Bay and Shenzhen Harbor. Other information collected included land use laws, environmental regulation, and government reports. The grayscale image was created by the water indices, can be segmented and distinguished as water and land with a threshold value. There are four indices that are widely used for coastline extraction. The weighted normalized difference water index was used for this research. After getting the water and land binary image, a GIS tool was implemented to convert the raster layers to polygons. Then a tool was implemented to get the coastlines. All Landsat images were processed by these methods, <gasps> and the coastlines of both areas over the last 30 years were delineated. Please keep in mind the study only analyzed the wetlands and submerged lands impacted along the coastline. The research team did not analyze inland wetland impacts. For Tampa Bay, the coastline analysis noted that approximately 57 acres of wetlands or submerged lands were filled for the creation of new land during the 30-year study period. Comparing the 1984 and the 2016 aerials as shown here, it appears the fill was the formation of Hooker's Point, which is east of Davis Island. For China, the analysis noted that approximately 5,436 acres of new land and or aquaculture was created over the same 30-year period. Here is an example of 875-acre wetland area being converted to ag agricultural and aquacultural areas. Here's another example. This one is two areas of submerged lands being converted to urban lands. Shangsheng Harbor has experienced changes largely due to impacts by man-made activities. These are the main reasons for the coastline conversion. China is among the fastest developing country in the world, and its economic growth has largely relied on the development of its coastal regions. Former President Hu set a goal to double China's 2010 gross domestic product. Regionally, the plan included building marine economic development zones and emphasizing coastal development. There are strict policies on the conversion of farmland for urban use. Since there was a lack of legal constraints on land creation, also known as reclamation in China, creating new land from the filling of wetlands and submerged lands became a major approach to meeting the demand for new land in coastal cities. Another reason to promote land creation pro projects was their enormous economic profits. The cost of land creation was very low compared to the new land prices. <coughs> Much of the wetland impacts for Tampa Bay occurred prior to our study period. Here you see an aerial of Apollo Beach in 1938. 
for the same location in 2018 as the aerial below. It is estimated that prior to Florida becoming a state, there were 20.3 million acres of wetlands, consisting of 54% of the state of Florida. Historically, these wet areas have been regarded as a hindrance to productive land use. This table includes the coastal and inland wetland impacts that have occurred statewide. From 1780 to 1980, it's estimated that Florida lost 9.3 million acres of wetlands, the most acreage lost in the continental U.S. for that time period. That is an estimated 127 acres of impact per, per day for 200 consecutive years. From the 50s to the 70s, Florida lost an estimated 72,000 acres per year. Beginning in the 70s and the 80s, there was a decline in Florida well and impacts to 23,700 acres per year. In Tampa Bay, it's estimated that 81% of the seagrasses and 44% of the mangroves were destroyed. In 1985 to 1996, estimates are 5,000 impacts of acres per year, with an 81% decline of the loss rate from the 70s. Furthermore, from 2004 to 2010, the loss rate was 4,000 acres per year for the state of Florida. Here we have a zoomed in um, aerial of Apollo Beach from 1938. You can see Highway 41 and Wolf Branch Creek. And you can use them for reference points. And here we are 2018 for Apollo Beach. So much of this development happened prior to a lot of the wetland regulation that we had. Many factors contributed to the decline in wetland loss rate over the past few decades. The federal, state, and local governments, environmental organizations, local residents, <coughs> realized the environmental degradation caused by human activities and tried to address the environmental issues through coastal management plans and regulations. This growing recognition and concern over environmental problem, problems in the 70s and 80s resulted in significant legislation, including federal environmental statutes and in Hillsborough County, the wetland rule in 1985. Over the years, there have been more laws, regulations, and policies developed to attempt to protect environmental quality and socioeconomic resource values that wetlands provide, including no net loss of wetlands, meaning that if a wetland is permitted for impact, it must be replaced. Comparing the development strategies in the two areas, Tampa Bay is at a developing, developed stage and Shenzhen Harbor in China is at a developing stage. Since China is still at a phase of this rapid development of its marine economy, it is predicted that more land creation and aquaculture projects will be permitted and implemented in the next few decades. In order to mitigate the impacts by human activities on the environment, China's government could re reference the effective environmental policies from Tampa Bay, such as no net loss of wetlands. Wetlands can be lost in the process of economic and urbanized development. However, the same area of wetlands needs to be created in other nearby areas to, main an, to maintain an equal ecological value. Therefore, the Chinese government should follow the principle of sustainable development by issuing laws, regulations, policies, and environmental programs to control these man-made impacts. The governments at different levels should cooperate with each other to execute the environmental legislations effectively, efficiently, and regularly. And parks along the coastline would help preserve the wetlands and submerged lands in China. In terms of preserving natural landscapes and protecting the vulnerable coastal environmental for future generations, coastal planning decision makers should not only consider economic values and short-term benefits, but also integrate values of ecological, social, cultural, and long-term benefits. The research documented that during this 30-year study period, the coastline of Tampa Bay was relatively stable compared to China. The majority of Tampa Bay's well and impacts occurred prior to the study period, when the U.S. was a developing country. China is at this developing stage now. 
While these results can be used for environmental and coastal management for developing countries, our environmental work in Tampa Bay is not over. Challenges to wetland protection regulation are becoming more prevalent, as well as the continued stress on the wetlands with new construction projects to keep up with the increasing population in Tampa Bay. We must continue to recognize that wetlands are an invaluable public resource. Measures should be actively sought to reduce and eliminate wetland losses and restore the functions lost. Even though Tampa Bay is considered part of a developed country, we must continue to carefully balance our economic, social, and environmental goals for the future of Tampa Bay. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much for this um, very informative report. You know, sometimes we kind of, I think, tend to feel like We've reached a level where there's a good legislation, there's no net loss, we've got EPC, we can coast along. But as you say, you know, say in your conclusions, there is constant pressure. There have been recent and current uh, suggestions to fill, um, create land by uh, filling submerged lands in Tampa Bay. There is also the importance of wetlands, I think, is increasing as we face sea level rise and uh, flooding from from not only sea level rise but from ever intensifying storm events uh, and rain filling um, the wetlands and, and uh, 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 watersheds um, well up uh, well inland from the coast we have to protect our wetlands there uh, for their uh, function in in protecting our communities from flooding so Thank you very much for this um, presentation. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. I'll, I'll just ask a couple questions. So some of it was back and forth between China or the state of Florida or locally, so I had a little trouble. But um, I guess there was 4,000 acres that have been lost since 2010, I mean um, 2000 to 2010. Yes, for the state of Florida. Oh, for the entire state? The entire state. Not what about county. in in uh, Hillsborough County. We average 30 acres of impact a year. About in 30? Including roadway projects, infrastructure projects. Okay, and do we expect that that will just be about the status quo, that that's? So far, we've averaged about 30 acres a year for the past five years or so. Now, as development does increase, there's more and more pressure to build in the wetlands. But we use uh, the wetland rule and our basis of review to go through reasonable use of the property. And that's how we evaluate if a wetland impact will be approved or not. And even if it is approved, then they still have to mitigate for their loss of that wetland. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, report. Kim. That was, that was a great report. Um, with that, we'll be moving on to the environmental legislative report with uh, Rick Marotti. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, as you're aware, the uh, legislative session started a little early this year due to the national primaries that are upcoming. Uh, the session started January 14th. And as always, it's a 60-day session, and we are right now in the middle of week three. I'm just gonna give you a few highlights of some legislation we're tracking. The good news right now is we're not seeing any uh, environmental preemption that seems to impact our day-to-day our -day functions, but you know, that's an, it's, we're early in the session, so we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, Brownfields legislation, uh, Senate Bill 1315, House Bill 1001, try to give a little more clarity as to what qualifies as an affordable housing project so you can get tax credits if you're doing a brownfield on affordable housing. So they just give you a little more criteria for the developer to understand what would get them the tax credits. They also make it a little more, um, uh, a little more incentive to uh, do affordable housing, parks, or recreation lands on brownfields by not having the strict job creation criteria uh, that's cr that is required in the Brownfields laws right now. So that's a that's a good uh, positive change. There is a uh, public notification bill, uh, Senate Bill 492 by Senator Cruz, and this is building upon existing law that requires uh, discharges to be uh, notified to the DEP immediately, and then the DEP puts it on their website. And if you subscribe, they'll send you an email about these discharges. This law is adding what m someone may have to notify as a discharge. 
some of the examples are radiation pollution uh, and more violations of water quality standards, but also two of the more um, uh, chemicals of concern that you're seeing a lot more in the news is PFOAs and PFOSs. I won't even try to pronounce them, but the PFOAs are those detergents and foaming, uh, f uh, foaming agents and dispersants uh, typically associated with firefighting uh, foams. And the PFOSs are more like the fabric protectors, Scotch guards type products. Those things get in the water uh, system, don't break down, uh, can develop uh, or cause problems with uh, growth, uh, development, human growth. So it's becoming more of an issue people are tracking. So they're saying if, you've, if there's a release of those, they have to be notified. The um, an interesting part of this bill that impacts local governments is it says that the Department of Health if the, or a local government, if they become aware of any type of discharge, not just these newer ones that are being proposed, they have an extra obligation to report it to the, the person creating the discharge and to the state um, within 24 hours also. So they just kind of want the, not just the discharge of themselves, but they want the local government to join and share in that knowledge so the DEP, so the DEP can know about discharges soon also. Uh, the bill uh, hasn't been, I don't think, heard in any committees yet, but we'll be tracking that. Next bill is a stormwater management bill, Senate Bill 686 and House Bill 405. This is one that's proposing that for new developments and or redevelopments, they create larger stormwater systems that will capture more nutrients uh, along the, this is still, this is following the governor's many uh, proposals to control nutrient pollution in the state water, waterways. Uh, hasn't been heard in any committees yet. Um, environmental reg regulation, the next bill, House Bill 773 uh, and Senate Bill 326. This one actually is moving very quickly and surprisingly, last week, just in the second uh, week of the session, it already passed the House unanimous, unanimously, 119 to 0. This is something that almost passed last year. Uh, the main thing it's trying to accomplish is to give better definition of what is a contaminated recyclable waste stream, meaning strings and plastics in, a, in, a, in the recycling materials that can't be recycled. So it's gonna require local governments to put a little more clarity in the contracts with the haulers, what is or isn't uh, contaminated, and what has to be done if, they, if a hauler uh, discovers the contaminated materials. It takes a little less burden off the haulers to have more clarity. What's more important to the EPC is to the two other issues on the, on the slide is um, there are many exemptions in state, uh, in state law. One of the best example ones, if you're building a small dock, uh, you can build it without a permit from the DEP. It's an exemption. But sometimes a local government says, well, prove you have the exemption. Well, this law is saying you don't have to ask the city. You can't. You as a local can't ask a citizen they have an exemption because it's built into law. They should be able to utilize it. So it's, it's just keeping the locals from asking for that exemption. But um, I don't, don't have a concern about that, that uh, concept. The other issue is when um, there's exemptions currently in law for repairing or replacing docks that already exist that, that are either exempt or have a permit. But sometimes they're just totally wiped away from a storm. So for the past three years, it's been an effort to change the legislation saying, well, let those people rebuild that dock or repair that dock within five feet of where it was because it's kind of some, sometimes hard to pinpoint where that dock might be. Law says you can't build over new resources. You have to keep it within the five feet of the last dock. Uh, and so like I said, this bill is moving pretty quickly. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, next bill, Senate Bill 712. This one also has uh, been already heard in two Senate committees. This is the same effort as last year that uh, came close to passing, which is the proposal to move tanks, septic tank regulation from the Department of Health to the DEP. And also, once it, if it is moved to the DEP, the DEP has a mandate to bulk up their regulation of septic tanks to help minimize nutrient pollution into the waterways, where it has an uh, impact on local governments. If uh, this, this bill would say, if, if, you can, if, if it can be proved that 20% of the pollution in a certain water body segment is from nutrient uh, nutrient pollution from, that can be identified because of septic tanks, then the local government will also have to participate and try to come up with a plan to help reduce that pollution in their community. Um, so we'll, we'll be tracking other bills, but see these are some of the highlights I thought I should bring to your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? All right. Um, I, I, I might speak with you later about that uh, septic sewage pollution bill and understand the ramifications of that. Okay. Um, and finally, the uh, executive director's report, Ms. Doherty. Thank you, Commissioner. 
Um, the first thing that I want to tell everyone is Rick and I will be traveling to Tallahassee to meet with our local delegation uh, this afternoon. So for the next two days, you know, we'll be up there and telling them about all the good things that EPC is doing. Um, the other uh, commissioners wanted to uh, talk about our holiday festivities. Thanksgiving and Christmas provide the perfect opportunity to spread holiday cheer and to reflect on our many blessings. It is a time we take to thank our partners, stakeholders, and especially you as our commission. Because of your support, we are able to achieve environmental excellence and make our environment better for the citizens of Hillsborough County. The holidays are also a time for EPC staff to personally give back to and support our community. This year, we collected two SUVs full of gifts for both Elves for Elders and the Redlands Christian Migrant Association campaigns. Additionally, our volunteers handcrafted over 50 blankets for parents and babies in the NICU unit of Brandon Regional Hospital. I would like to personally thank the Philanthropic Committee, our volunteers, and all our staff who made donations of gifts, time, and talents to these worthy causes. They care, they show for our community is truly amazing. Uh, I attended the Resiliency Leadership Summit held this month in St. Petersburg. It's going to be an annual thing. It was sold out. It was an amazing conference. Uh, local, regional, and national experts gathered to discuss the economic, social, and environmental challenges ahead for 2030 and to define the goals for the Tampa Bay Regional Action Plan. And I think probably one of the most riveting panels was when all of the mayors uh, came from uh, St. Petersburg, Tampa, Clearwater, and sat there and talked about what they plan to do. Um, commissioners, we also uh, host interns at EPC. I, I put that out to the two interns that were here today, uh, but we were pleased to take commissioner's intern, Jason Fitzgibbons, and uh, Commissioner White's last intern, Andrew Paul Griffiths, for a tour of EPC. Both Jason and Andrew study economics at USF, and we wish them the best of luck. And I think, Commissioner Merman, you're... Your intern is also studying economics and poli sci. Michelle Jenkins, our sustainability coordinator, who was here for our presentation, uh, does an outstanding job representing EPC and helping to promote solar in Hillsborough County. She and Commissioner Kemp attended the Florida Solar Congress held last October. The conference hosted by Solar United Neighbors of Florida brought together supporters from across the state to discuss the current solar landscape and the future of solar energy in Florida. Staff participated in two community outreach events, the Hillsborough County 16th Annual Neighborhoods Conference and the Nature Expo at the Florida Birding and Nature Festival held at the HCC Brandon campus. EPC participated in other events. Uh, we supported the University of Tampa's pilot career program and their annual etiquette dinner, which are now designed to help students with resume, networking, and interview building schools. Staff also reached out to five local schools and 300 students during the Hillsborough County's Great American Teach-In. And Andy Zadro did his annual guest speaker at Stetson Law School Career Day, sponsored by the Environmental Law Society. And finally, EPC is partnering with Hillsborough County sustainability staff to organize and host the Love Hillsborough event on February 13th at Chalura Park, right across the street from 1130 to 130. The event will highlight sustainability initiatives championed by this board and the good work being done by Hillsborough County. We're looking forward to showcasing all of what EPC does and being one of the many reasons to love sustainability, love our community, and love Hillsborough. And with that, that concludes my executive director report. Thank you. Um, and seeing no other discussion of that, is there any future uh, items anyone wants to mention? Then I'll just let you know that we're planning to bring microplastics back in February, yeah. and uh, Sam O'Robbie has been coordinating with George Cassidy and Doug Holt to bring septic back sometime in March or April for a comprehensive study. Excellent. I look forward to that. Yes. Uh, discussion Thanks. of septic and sewage. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite topics. I know Commissioner Merman's as well. So, with that, I think we're adjourned. Thank you, commissioners.